time when our beloved country stands at its crossroads, the battle for the soul of our nation is upon us. Yes, we're Christians and conservatives. We're not ashamed to say it. We'll not stand idly by and watch this country go to ruin. We stand for God, family, country, and the values that made our nation great, great. Our soldiers pay the price for these freedoms, and we understand that freedom is worth defending. Like our forefathers, we stand for these undeniable truths. Our voices will be heard across this land. Our values and freedoms are non-negotiable. With one heart and one voice, the time is now to rescue America. God bless America. We are the Flashpoint Army. We're patriots inspired and united to protect our God-given rights and values, which make this nation like no other. No matter how epic the battle may be for our nation's soul, we stand together and we will ensure that the light of our God, the strength of our convictions, and the greatness of these United States will shine brighter than ever before as we reclaim the values that will make us great again. Welcome to Flashpoint Live! So glad and so glad you're watching at home to be a part of us. You may be seated. Uh, uh, Andrew, I've asked Andrew to bring you a word. This is another change that we're doing this year. So please, I haven't told you what to say. Just say so, if you say something about me, make sure it's nice. <laughs> I don't know anything bad about uh, you. So I Andrew Womack, would you give him a hand? Thank you. Well, I want to welcome all of you here. This is a real honor. We've been looking forward to having Flashpoint here. How many of you are outside of the area, say outside of uh, 30 miles from here? Wow. How many are outside of the state? Praise God. Have we got any foreigners here? There's a few. Praise God. Well, welcome. We are glad to have you here. You know, we're going to be hearing from some great uh, speakers. Uh, I'm kind of really low key, and I, f I feel a little out of place with all of these high powered people that'll come and get you screaming and running. That's just not me. But I really am passionate. I just don't express it real. You know, we went to Disney World and they took pictures, you know, when you're on the roller coaster right as you crest the thing, and you could have taken a picture of me right now, and that's the way it was. And so I have to tell you when I'm excited, but I'm excited to have people here, and I'm excited about what God is doing in this nation. And you know, we've been involved and we are fighting and doing everything that we know to deal with this. And again, we're going to have some speakers that are going to fire you up and share from a lot of different angles. But let me just say that, you know, uh, in 2021, I think it was, I was in Oklahoma City and I was in a, a meeting and it was all about trying to call our, our Christians to get involved and to take a stand and to do things. And we were having praise and worship and it was just powerful. I mean, I was sitting there just worshiping God and thinking, Lord, this is awesome. It was actually my niece that was putting on the meeting, and it was the first time she'd ever had a meeting, and they had about seven or 800 people there. And I thought, man, this is awesome. So I was just worshiping the Lord and thinking, God, it's great that we got young people coming up and getting involved. And as I was worshiping the Lord, the Lord spoke to me, and he said, someday the people in this auditorium will be telling the youth of their generation what it was like to be a part of the Third Great Awakening. Yeah. 
And that's not a terminology I don't think I had ever used. I might have said revival, move of God, or something like that. But it was just, it was not me. I believe it was God speaking to me. And so I said, Lord, are you saying that we are going to have a great awakening? And he said, no, it's not coming. It's already begun. And I really believe that. And even though, you know, we see so much bad stuff in the news, I believe that God can work all of this together for good. I was visiting with, um, I think it was Lance or Hank back there just a while ago, and I really believe that even the things that Colorado did, uh, trying to take Trump off of the ballots, I actually think it's a good thing because there's other states that were trying to do it. Colorado was the first one. It was heard in the Supreme Court today. And from what I've heard, I think it's a slam dunk that they are going to deny that. Amen. Amen. USA, 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 Amen. USA, USA. And so I believe that that's actually worked out for good because if they rush this judgment through, it's going to stop all of these other states from trying to do that. And then just in uh, July the 4th of this year, we were having a meeting right here. We have a musical that we put on that is called In God We Trust. And I tell you, it is awesome. And we were just worshiping the Lord. And of course, this last July, the 4th was the 247th anniversary. And I was sitting right down there and the Lord spoke to me. And he said, on the 250th anniversary of this nation, even the news media is going to have to acknowledge that this wokeness is leaving, that it didn't work. And I believe that's a word from God. And then in September, I got my third word and uh, I delivered a prophecy and basically the Lord said that in two years time, some of the people who are uh, spouting out the stuff the worst and are doing so much bad that they are going to be gone. Amen. Amen. And I don't know what that means, whether they're gone or whether they're just out of leadership or whatever, but I believe that we are seeing things turn around. So we're gonna be sharing a lot of things. People are gonna be um, trying to motivate us and encourage us, but to me, that was really encouraging. I believe those are words from the Lord, and I do believe that the best days of this nation are still ahead of us, and we're gonna see it turned around. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And you know, it's not a matter of just, uh, as Gene was saying, it's not a political thing only. We've got to be involved in that, but it's a spiritual battle. And so uh, those words have encouraged me, but we are also fighting and doing things. I'd like to ask Richard Harris, if he would, to come up here for just a moment. And uh, Richard is the director of our Truth and Liberty uh, Coalition. And we started that, I think, when? In 2017. 2017. And he's directing that. And I'd like him just to share just a little bit about what we're doing to try and influence this. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, uh, Truth and Liberty, we are, our, our mission at Truth and Liberty is to educate, unify, and mobilize the body of Christ to stand for truth in the public square in actually all the seven mountains of influence. And we've got five strategic ways that we're doing that. The first one I want everybody here to know about is the Truth and Liberty live call-in show. So every day of the week, Monday through Friday, 3.30 to 5 o'clock Mountain Time, uh, you can catch Andrew Womack, myself, Alex McFarland, um, uh, right now, Pastor Dwayne Sheriff, but Bishop E.W. Jackson, who is one of the best preachers ever, uh, and also um, uh, Janet Porter. Uh, and we interview Christian leaders, people who are out there doing the work of God in the public square, everybody from the local sheriff all the way up to congressmen and generals and everything else to connect you to what's happening so that you also can stand. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is our resources. So our website, we've got a resources center that has literally hundreds of resources and links on there, all everything from your rights in the public schools to how your ministry can, uh, you know, stay out of hot water, 
but still stand for truth and everything in between. It's awesome. And we also have events. So every year we've got our conference, Andrew, in September, uh, and that's the annual Truth and Liberty Conference. But we've also got an awards banquet, and that's coming up in May. I'm super excited because our keynote speakers this year is going to be Riley Gaines. And uh, yeah, amen. And then uh, we're going to be giving awards to Pat Bradley and to, um, uh, to uh, who's our second one? <laughs> Coach Joe Kennedy. Yeah, praying Joe. That's right. And, um, and the other thing is we, we mobilize the church. So in Colorado this year, we're going to be printing and distributing over one million voter guides in churches all over this state uh, to turn this state uh, back to red. And there's so many other things that we're doing. Uh, I can't name it all. But check us out on our website at truthandliberty.net. Thanks, Richard. All right, sir. What a blessing. Praise the Lord. So many of you know Colorado is known as a liberal state. Did you know that even before Roe versus Wade passed, Colorado allowed abortion up till birth? And it was one of the leaders in that. And uh, we've got an openly homosexual governor. We've got uh, transgender people in our uh, Congress, and it's uh, the governor and all of the Congress is all liberal, and we've been to the um, uh, Capitol, and we've uh, protested, kept them going until one or two in the morning listening to things, and so far they've turned to deaf ear. But as Richard was sharing, we've been putting out voter guides. We have seen a number of school districts flipped. We have seen people elected. And even right here in uh, Woodland Park, little old Woodland Park, Colorado, we have seen the school board flip. We were the very first uh, school board in the nation to adopt the America First, uh, birth, the American Birthright curriculum, which goes back and teaches the proper history of this nation and extracts all of the woke stuff. And. So it is beginning to catch on. And so anyway, uh, we aren't only praying and believing, but we are doing something. And I'd like to just encourage you. You know, the Bible says in uh, James chapter 2, verse 19, you believe that there's one God, you do well. The devils also believe and tremble. But the next verse says, but won't you know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead. That's one of the most sarcastic statements in the Bible. You know, if you believe that there's a God, you hadn't done anything the devil hadn't done. It says faith without works is dead. I'd like to say this, and this may shock some people, but if you would understand the way I'm saying it, I believe it's absolutely true that prayer without works is dead. And we have had lots of Christians that say, well, I'm praying for this nation, and they will fast, and they will do all kinds of things, and they'll have conventions to get together and pray, but they wouldn't dare go vote. And they wouldn't dare take a stand at their business. And they wouldn't stand up for anything. And I tell you, that is the reason that we're in this problem is because the church has withdrawn into our four walls. Did you know the liberals don't have churches? They're out in the marketplace. They're influencing people all over the place. But Christians have withdrawn into their four walls. And so we've got to get out into the marketplace and that's what we're trying to do. So I'm, I'm on television. We're doing things, preaching the gospel and taking a stand. But we've also got this truth and liberty going. And, uh, man, it's beginning to make a difference. And I believe that we are going to see America turn back. Yeah. Amen. And, you know, I, I quote John Adams often. He was speaking during the American Revolution. And they were asking him, so do you think we can win? And there was people debating whether they would get involved or not in the revolution based on whether they thought we could win. And John Adams said, duty is ours, results are God's. And he was making a statement that it doesn't matter whether they could win or not. They were going to do what was right and trust God for the results. And... <clears throat> And there are so many people today that are sitting here and they're feeling frustrated. Of course, most of the news, not on Victory Network, but most of the news is just totally negative. And we hear this and people are discouraged thinking that, you know, what's the use? 
But I had David Barton on my program with me, and it was really neat. We had a caller come in and say the, the elections are rigged, the Dominion voting machines. What's the point in voting? Why should I even vote? And David Barton, I thought it was really good what he said because he said, you are going to stand before God and you're going to have to give an answer for the freedom that was given to you, the responsibility that was given to you to vote. And he said, whether they steal your vote or not, you are going to answer to God for did you do the right thing? And I thought that was awesome. <laughs> Praise God. And so, again, I don't think we should only just do the spiritual thing. Uh, we're working on elections, and I was talking with Michael Lindell just a little while ago, and, man, they've got, I think he said 300-something uh, places that they are getting to do paper ballots. And so we're working on it, and we need to do both. But I tell you, we have a responsibility to do what's right, regardless of what the outcome is. I had a man come to me who was a male nurse, and he said that God told him not to take the vaccine. And, you know, I'm not, for, I'm not talking about the vaccine right now, but he said God told him not to take the vaccine. And yet he was working in a hospital, and they said, if you don't take the vaccine, we're going to fire you. And so he came to me, and he says, what do I do? And I said, well, you've answered your own problem. You said God told you not to take it. And he says, but they'll fire me. And, you know... I was nice to the guy, but that really grates on me <laughs> that a person has a word from God and God told them not to do it. And they're going to debate whether they do what God said because it might cost them something. You know, when you do that, in a sense, you've made yourself God. It's idolatry. You're putting yourself up there and thinking, well, God said this, but here's what I feel. I tell you, duty is ours, results are God's. We just need to stand up and speak the truth. And if we would do that, the truth will beat a lie every single day if people would stand up and quit apologizing for it and they would just speak the truth. Plus, the Bible says that in their heart, Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, says that in their heart, God has revealed himself against all unrighteousness and all ungodliness of man. That means that homosexuality, transgenderism, the abuse that they're doing to our children with hormones and sex reassignment surgery and just everything else that you can talk about, God's already shown them that they're wrong in their heart that they know it's wrong. But if somebody would stand up and speak the truth, God would bear witness with that truth and bring conviction to them. But in the absence of people speaking the truth, many people are just uh, searing their conscience, numbing themselves to the conviction of the Lord. And we've got to stand up and start speaking the truth. Amen. When I was in Vietnam, I had a lot of atheists come against me and say that they didn't believe in God. And I used to argue with them. And finally, I just started basing my actions on those verses that they know in their heart that it's true. And so I just quit arguing with them. And I said, that's a lie. You know there's a God. And, you know, some of them didn't agree and they criticized me. But when the bombs got to dropping and the bullets were flying, every one of those people were crying out to the God that they said they didn't believe in. It's a mind game. And the people that are involved in all of this wokeness, they are deceiving themselves. They are either deceived or they are a deceiver. And if we would stand up and speak the truth, I believe that the truth will beat a lie every single time. So, again, I'm, I welcome Flashpoint here, Gene and the whole staff and all of the speakers. Thank you for coming. And praise God, we believe that this is going to be used by God to make a difference. Amen. So welcome. God bless you. Amen. Give him a hand. Amen. 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 All right. I got a few people I ran into backstage. I thought you might like to meet. Um, would you please welcome a man who needs to get better at being patriotic? Hank Kuhneman. Pastor Hank Kuhneman. Hank Kuhneman. There he is. Okay. Uh, 
Did you notice Hank's wearing a jacket? I just want to make, make sure you guys caught that. I love you too. Thank you. You're so kind. Thank you. All right. How about America's Constitution coach, Rick Green? <laughs> and please welcome the guy who agreed to do the show was on my only guest on show number one, and he's still hanging around, my friend, Lance Wallnow. <laughs> Okay, you can be seated. Normally we would stand during this time, but my lungs are somewhere back in Fort Worth. Yeah. So, so I, I elected. So if there's a little pause during the night, you'll know. <laughs> Trying to get our breath. Welcome, guys. Glad you're here. Is this not a beautiful place or what? Oh, totally. Gorgeous. Yeah, it is. All right. So I, I want to start off tonight talking about Supreme Court. Uh, you know, there was a little hearing that went on today. Uh, and Andrew Womack referred to it. Uh, so let's talk about what did you get from that today, Rick Green? I'll start with you. Yeah, I think I could summarize the hearing in about six hours if y'all have time. Um, <laughs> No, actually, just a couple of minutes. I mean, they used a whole lot of big words. Uh, and basically, you have to believe four lies. Number one, that there was an insurrection. Number two, that, that Donald Trump actually either participated or incited it. Number three, that the 14th Amendment, therefore, would keep him from being able to run for president. And number four, that a state can be the one to enforce that. That's essentially what the whole case is about. Those, those four lies have to be believed. And of course, we all know there wasn't an insurrection. Uh, that he did not only not participate in an insurrection, he encouraged people to be peaceful, that the 14th Amendment clearly does not apply to the president or to a former president. And even if it did, even if all three of those lies were true, there's a wonderful little line right at the end of the 14th Amendment in Section 5 that gives the power to Congress to make laws regarding this, not one state here in Colorado to be able to make this up on their own. And, and you listen to the questions. and. I'm telling you, I, I mean, I, I'm not going to say 9-0. I'm going to say 8-1 because I like to hedge my bet. But I, I think Trump wins this thing at least 8-1 to one and, and sends Colorado's folks packing. So. All right, uh, Lance, I don't know if I sent you this article I saw just, I think it was today, about uh, New York saying they want to take him off the ballot. Uh, look at that compared to Colorado. I know you've got a something magnificent you want to say. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. That, that Thank you, Gene. Totally for, impress everyone. Thank you, Gene. All right, so this is like, I, we've always said doing this show that we start off as preachers, revival is great. And we started off really, we were all of different backgrounds, but we went into the ministry thinking that was what we're called to do. Hank, what are you doing? Are you leaving? <laughs> So we uh, go we into just the ministry, the and that's what we decided to do. Then we get involved with Flashpoint, and we had to do an immediate deep dive right. on all that's things true. civics-related, electoral college, how the Constitution works, protesting. And so we were all doing immersion. This isn't like we started there. We had to get into it. So I'm telling you, today was another chapter in my education, because I listen to the court. And no, normally I'm not paying attention to what's going on in the Supreme Court. Donald Trump has a way of making anything like reality TV anyway. So I'm packing to come here and I'm going, and I'm playing the, the, the it's fascinating. So Sotomayor and Justice Roberts, and you listen to how they go back and forth. Now I'm going to give you, and I mean this sincerely, I think it's an accurate assessment. We work with people, we work with media, we work with all. Here's what it sounded like to me. If there was thought bubbles over the Supreme Court justice, even the liberals, it was like, how could you guys be so stupid to bring this to us? They're trying to stay out of the political storm. That's right. None of them want to be deciding the destiny of America. I mean, you heard Schumer threatening them with reaping the whirlwind just if they went a little bit pro-life. So they don't want to decide who's going to be president. And the questions they were asking were like what I call, hey, stupid questions, which means they didn't say, hey, stupid, but it was implied. Like, so... Uh, what do you think the impact would be on elections if one state out of 50 could actually disrupt the entire presidential election for the whole country? How would that play out, in your opinion? Yeah. Oh, and then they give their sophisticated answer. And it's interesting to hear a sophisticated answer to a, hey, stupid question. 
So <laughs> then, then, the, then, the, then the other one was, um, and this would have been John, for Justice Roberts, he said, you realize that um, there are certain people, states, that are saying, if we were to decide to take one candidate off the ballot in Colorado, they would remove, uh, let's say, another candidate. <laughs> There's only one other candidate <laughs> off their ballot. Can you see how this could create more disruption? Than it? It's kind of like a hey, stupid question. Like, yeah. hey, do you guys think this through? That's why I'm glad we're here in Colorado. Yeah. Because <laughs> wokeness at a certain point becomes entertaining. It does. It's so absurd, yeah. it actually starts crossing over into Monty Python land where it's funny. <laughs> so, and that's, so anyway, that's what I was getting today. And, 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 and by the way, Liz, the, you know, the most woke member of the court who, who couldn't define a woman when appointed actually asked some of the, hey, stupid, like it yeah. doesn't list president here. Don't you think if they meant for the president to be involved? I mean, she really hammered no, no, in she, on that. No, she goes like this. She it goes, was great. She goes, you know, these were written, let's talk about this, these were written for the insurrection idea was for participants in the Confederate Army that might run for office in a Confederate state. That's the context of what they were dealing with. Nowhere do they mention the president because they weren't thinking of presidents. They were thinking of the Civil War states and inciting a problem. And it, have you considered that since 1883? That's been, you know, the established. <laughs> and then they give their sophisticated, hey, stupid answer. She may not know what a woman is, but I think she knows what a president is. So I think we're, yeah. I think she's going to be on the right ah, side of this thing before it's over. Exactly. The lights are coming on. Okay, Pastor Hank. Um, All right. Well, I, you know, when you called me, I was running around this campus for a two-mile run. And uh, <laughs> just getting my workout in. It is great to be here, Andrew. This is a beautiful place. But let's I saw you in a golf cart. Sure. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. After my two mile run. He was moving his feet. <laughs> but I think there's some other people that are about to run out of breath, and that is these uh, that are trying to take our country from us. You know, when I hear about this, you know, I don't follow the news very closely. I do it on purpose because a lot of it, they're, they're lying. They're trying to create uh, a lot of, you know, false narratives. But I did look at today with this Supreme Court, and, and, and I feel like the Lord is really wanting us to focus on something, and it's this. How many remember the story of the three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and uh, Oregano, the, the Italian that was thrown in? I'm Italian, so, you know, we Italians, but anyway, they turned up the heat seven times hotter in the furnace, but guess what? It backfired, and ultimately, because the fourth man showed up, and what am I saying? God is showing up in our country. And no matter how much they try to turn the heat up against us or against Donald Trump, who God has put his hand on, it's going to continue to backfire. And ultimately, we are going to see him and us come through this, and we're going to get our country back. Now, this is what you have to understand. We are in the high places in the sense of, you know, Denver, Colorado. Whenever God came in the high places, remember Moses went up to meet God in the high place, Mount Sinai, a visitation. And I don't think it's a coincidence that today we are here and they also, from the highest court of the land, began to hear this case. And here's why. 2024 is a very pivotal year in the earth. Lance, you said something on Flashpoint on Tuesday, and I think it was 40% of nations are having elections that are major, major elections that will affect not only their, their nation but also the earth. And the reason it's this way in 2024 is because 24, if you understand Scripture, is a governmental number. And it represents the kingdom of God, the court of heaven. You can read in the book of Revelation, there's 24 elders that are with God in the court of heaven. And I say that because when God chooses to do something because you, the people, have prayed, it doesn't matter what they write in the liberal media. It doesn't matter what they want to do to try to push out God's agenda. When God renders a verdict from the court of heaven, God then goes above the Supreme Court and all courts, and he begins to rule, he begins to render a verdict, and as a result, we begin to see not only the will of God come, but the will of the people. And this is what we're going to see. Lastly, Pastor Gene, I told you on Monday, I called Pastor Gene. 
I said, we need to be aware of something. I was, uh, you know, looking at the camera and I heard the Holy Spirit speak to me and he said, uh, Hank, they're going to look at making a change on, on the left. And he said, they're going to try to spring something on this country. They're going to do a spring thing, a spring fling that's going to try to alter what you see with who's running against who. And I really believe that ultimately when the Supreme Court rules the way they rule, they're going to have to backpedal and look for another answer. You stay strong, keep your mouth right, and we are going to make America great again for God and for his people. Okay, so here's my, here's my question, though, in, in light of that, Pastor Hank. The, um, how do we as believers, the Christians that are in the room that uh, believe God, and they, they're agreeing with everything you're saying, but how should we pray? I know we got to get involved. But how should we even pray about this? Because we don't, it seems to be that so, so many fingers go in so many different directions. How is it that we, how should we pray about it? I, I think we need to take the position that the, uh, uh, the disciples said in Luke chapter 1. I was praying in September of last year and I said, God, speak to me a simple word for the sake of the people. What would you say about 2024? And he spoke very simple and he said these words. He said, Hank, tell the people to draw closer to God, draw closer to him. There's, there's something that happens in intimacy. If you draw near to God, he draws near to, near to us and we need God in our country. Second, he said, bind the thief, but he said, you've got to change how you're praying. We often think about, I'll make it quick, we, we often talk about, it's all about the cross. Well, it is about the cross, but it's not just about the cross. Then they, people say, well, it's about the resurrection. Well, no, it's about the cross, the resurrection, but then it's about the ascension. Jesus was handed the scepter of righteousness, called God, set, set, told, sit down at my right hand until I make thy enemy your footstools, gave that authority to us as joint heirs, and we got to exercise it. And lastly, in Luke 1, what did Jesus teach us? This is what he taught us. He said, the first thing you do is you draw near to God. You say, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's the worship, the honor of God. Second, you take your authority. He said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that's not a religious prayer. If I went over to Russia right now at Red Square and I put an American flag right in front of Putin's office and said, the United States kingdom comes, what do you think Putin would do? <laughs> Putin would not like it. Okay, neither does the kingdoms of darkness. And so we've got to pray from our heavenly seat of authority, and we need to pray, God, what David prayed. We're not talking about personal enemies. We're talking about those that are bent on evil to affect the masses. You know what David prayed? He said, Lord, shatter the teeth of the wicked. In other words, Lord, silence those today who think they can speak and lie and create deception and narratives that are not the spirit of truth. God, do not let them have a grip as they come down and they try to sexually exploit our children. We need to start praying from a position of authority that invokes the justice of God to come and manifest in the earth. Amen. All right. Okay, so many of you may not know that Lance was a pastor for a while. Where You were in the Northeast. 20 years. 20 years. I pastor for like maybe 25 years. Uh, and where that was northeast Philadelphia, right? Philadelphia and uh, okay. New England. Okay, so I want to ask you the same question. Yeah, I, I know you, you hear what Hank said. And how how do we take it from here? Yeah, and here's an important caveat. Charles Finney said that the reason why the nation was going to a civil war is because the pulpits had ceased to probe the conscience of the nation. That's it. And Amen. when the Word of God isn't being preached, and, and let's be honest about it, even the emphasis, you take a sermon series from a typical pastor or teacher for the last 20 years, it's all, to a great degree, focused on overcoming life and the blessing, almost like a narcissistic focus on unwrapping the package of benefits to believers. While the culture was being discipled by, uh, by what we call doctrines of demons, They've gotten to the point now where we have Protecting Kids Colorado, something you guys started right here in Colorado, because a mother who wasn't even a, a, a Republican uh, activist yeah. had an 11-year-old daughter who was being groomed by the school to transition. Right. And, uh, and, and as she went into depression and suicidal, the father stepped in and intervened, and the mom and dad got that kid pulled out. Now, they got, they're actually doing now an initiative in 
this state, and this is what has to happen. We have to have responses to what the enemy's doing that are practical at a local level. You and I have only so much influence at the national, everybody obsesses with where they have the least authority. You've cast your vote. Yeah, I know, we, I know I got an idea what you want to see happen, you know, with the presidency and the Supreme Court. But if we're not engaged locally where we have greater authority, then we're missing something. So like this Protecting Kids Colorado, this is just a group of you guys, citizens, that now they got a table out there. They've got a ballot initiative because they're awakening the parents, awakening the conscience of parents to see what is going on. My concern is that on the left, they look at us as though we're enemies. And you hear it, it's a very bizarre thing, really. When I, when I, when I read the, the hate press that you get, or that Sean Foy gets, or that I get, I, I, frankly, I read it more objectively when it's you than when it's me. When, it's, sure me, when it's me, I get upset. When it's you, it's like, oh, that's interesting. I got to call yeah. Gene about that. <laughs> but, but it's all the same thing. And so there's a spirit that is on their mind. Now, we got to be very careful because faith works by love. You cannot respond the same way. Even if what they're doing is, is to you tacitly wicked, the moment you get into that same spirit of we'll show you, we'll beat you, and this is where even in precatory prayers, because I believe in them, what, what Hank said about, you know, may they fall into the pit that they've dug, I pray those prayers. But I remember what Finney also said. He said, it's very hard to have an awakening and a political spirit at the same time. We have to rise above the us-them mentality and be thinking in terms of, my God, our children, my brother-in-laws, my sisters, they're under that woke deception. They think I'm the nut. And I have to love them in such a way that I could disagree fully with what they're doing but still be willing to lay down my life so that they could have knowledge of Christ in their life. And if I can't pray with that state of mind, my prayers are not prevailing. And to follow up with that, I think the key is, is what Paul taught us. Uh, he said, you know, vengeance is the Lord. And it's not us to take personal vengeance. It's God that does it. We just need to stand like the, the widow did against injustice. That's what it meant in Luke 18. Will the Son of Man find faith? Faith what? Faith in the injustice that was taking place. Would somebody stand and pray night and day, God avenge us speedily from our adversaries? And, and, and if I could add to that, just that doesn't mean disengage, right? What these guys are saying is not to disengage, oh but not to fight the way they fight, to fight honest That's and right. not be That's deceptive. And, and, and even like the family you're talking about, our mutual friend Kevin Lumberg, a former legislator here, did a whole movie about this family, artclubmovie.com. Go get it, watch it, share it. That's fighting back with truth. It's, right. it's, it's engaging in a way in, in, in that arena that we left off, you know, we thought just being nice and, and because we didn't want to play like they're playing, that too often we disengaged because we're trying to be nice and we thought that was the Christian thing to do. No, we need to fight, but we need to fight ethically, we need to fight truthfully, and we need to fight effectively and be smart in our strategy and, and our tactics. And I think we are this way. I just want to remind us of this, because it's going to heat up. It's going to heat up yeah, big time. Exactly. But we, we, I know that we've got the heart and ability to do this thing right, because I watched the Bill Maher experience. Every time Bill Maher gets it right, we all celebrate it. Because inevitably, he's going to screw up again. He did, but the moment you mention Trump, he's like, you know, take his brain goes somewhere. But but, he's, but you watch the Joe Rogan experience, and you watch the Russell Brand experience, and you, I'm watching Elon Musk even. And we've got to be careful to pray for these people that are influenced. It's the evidence that an awakening is happening. And, we, and then when Bill blows it, I get upset with him. It's like, how could you be so dumb? And you got everything else right. But then I catch myself and I say, but I'm praying for him to keep getting it right. That has to be our attitude towards the left. They will never, Rolling Stone, when, when the cry of freedom, what was the movie about? Sound double, of freedom. Sound of freedom. When the sound of freedom came sort out. Sort of a cry of freedom. They, it should have been cry. The sound of freedom, Rolling Stone made this asinine commentary about how this is like the, you know, the, the, the worm, the brain worms of, you know, of what, I don't know, conservative men or something like that. They came up with it. And I was listening to Charlie Kirk. Charlie said something. He said, you know what? He said, I try to stay disciplined that when we get it, when they get it right, I want to celebrate it. And uh, because they refuse to acknowledge any time we're right. right. What could be worse than fighting against 
someone who is trying to expose sex trafficking. But when you become ideologically toxic, you even attack the virtues of the other side. So we have to be able to actually say when they get it right, they get it right. So you cannot completely uh, create a mentality where the other is always a demon. And that's just intellectual honesty. We used to value that, right? Where we could say, you know, and disagree, like, well, like when Barack Obama started talking about fatherhood and the importance of fatherhood and, and fathers not being in the home was part of the problem. We said, hey, he's right. We need to honor this, th- th- this particular position that he's got, even though we disagreed with him on so many other things. So being willing to be intellectually honest, we've got to come back to that because sometimes on our side, we're, we're losing that. We got a lot of folks that are just so angry right now and so frustrated that they want to do like what you're saying and just lash out at the other side no matter what. I think this is wisdom that we need to be applying if we want to win long term. All right. And if you don't view politics as a mission field and you're working in politics, then you're going to get sucked in by all the wrong people. The world is going to take you in. And and before you know it, I have seen people from my school, a Christian school, go up to Washington, D.C., and after two years, they're like, oh, I don't know about this issue. I don't know about that issue. And I I can think of two friends right now that went in as Republicans and came out Democrat. And the bottom line in Washington, it's not a matter of whether you are left or right. It is a matter of whether or not you believe God exists or doesn't exist. That's right. Because if you believe that God exists, then you have an entirely different motivation for what you're doing. We know that we have a natural law and revealed law, and we are honoring our Creator. And it is inconceivable, as my pastor says, that the God who created human government would not want Christians involved in that government. And that is our mission. That's why you're here tonight. It's why you care so much about it. But if you don't have that same heart and that same mission, and if God has not called you to that right place and you're not listening to Him, then the world is going to take you. Because I believe that those few square miles up in Washington, D.C. is one of the greatest concentrations of spiritual warfare in our world today. And it's going to take men and women like you to stand up and speak out and say, we're going to hold our leaders accountable. We're going to show up in Colorado and across the nation and make our voices known and say, we are not just some faction of Christians who are going to check our religion at the door. We are people of faith who are going to stand out and speak up and turn out and change this nation. Amen. Yeah, I grew up in an amazing household with parents that cultivated an atmosphere of hearing God's voice from a young age. But that also comes from personal encounter, and that comes from the living, breathing Word of God. And every single one of us, as born-again believers, have the resurrection power of Jesus Christ burning on the inside of us. And the Bible is so clear that we are to be in the world and not of it. So it doesn't matter where you're called to, whether it be in political spheres, whether it be you're a stay-at-home mom, you're in a business setting, that the living God lives inside of you and you get to operate from that place of authority as a son and daughter of the living King. I think in the same way that us as individuals, everyone would agree that we all have a God-ordained purpose and destiny over our own lives. In the same way, so does a nation. So every nation has a call of God over their lives. And so it's so important as citizens of the United States of America to ask the Lord, what is the revelation on the calling of America? Why is it being so strategically under attack right now? And why is me as a believer, as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, who is created to be here and bring heaven to earth to establish his kingdom here, why is that under attack? Because the Bible clearly warned us that this would be what happened. So we should be rejoicing because these are the days that we are created for. We need to be informed about what's going on today. We need to know our history. We need to know our constitution. We need to read the Mayflower Compact. What was the covenant that the Lord made when the pilgrims came over here? It's very important because they're altering our history right now in the classrooms. So if you can approach things with a, the discernment of the word of God, you're gonna see past the smoke and nears and the business of aesthetics. And you're going to have the right words to be able to speak when people start bringing accusatory language to you. Sometimes it's better to keep your words short because they can't be twisted. The Lord is going to guide you. He's going to give you the right things to say. He's going to point you in the right direction of how to be able to educate yourself, how to educate your children, how to be able to speak to others who don't have an understanding when it comes to spiritual dimensions. That's why the Lord says tongues and interpretation. He's going to be able to give you language that you can speak to others so they can receive. You're fully equipped, and there's people here who have incredible ways to help equip you for the journey along the way. So when it comes to Christian nationalism, that's what I would say. One, we have the living Word of God. 
Two, we have an incredible history. And there is amazing people, people here who have provided wonderful educational equipment for you to be able to equip yourself along the way. I'm going to skip Pastor Ann because you've got something to wrap it up. Luke, I'll let you go next. At the risk of repeating what some of these folks have said, I think that we look at the world and we see them defining Christian nationalism and Americans defining Christian nationalism as Christians who don't leave their religion in the foyer when they walk out of the church building. I think they are terrified of that. I think that we have an epidemic of spineless Christians in the United States of America. And they are scared to death of people who recognize that God instituted the family, the church, and the state, and that we are recognizing and upholding these institutions. Do you know what they went after? And I watched this trailer three times before I showed up here tonight because I knew we'd talk about it. You know what they went after these guys for? They went after a gene for saying, we are taking our country back. We are taking our country back. We're not giving up any ground. Not a bit. Lance said, God wants to save America. Yeah. What's, what are we supposed to say? He doesn't want to save America? And the fact is that these Christians want to go into the public square, and the ones that they interviewed on these movies are like, oh, well, Christianity at its best is love and peace and tolerance and inclusivity. I don't know what kind of Christianity they're talking about. Christianity is about love, and love is telling people the truth. It's saying that there is such a thing as a man and a woman, that there are only two genders, that there is a God, that there is faith. And I was reading in Scripture before I came here that people are terrified also of Christians working and being involved in government and politics. Yes. And I was thinking about Daniel. Daniel was somebody who did not want to be in the position that he was put in. He was ripped out of Jerusalem. He was taken into captivity. And at the very bottom, he was basically deciding, I am going to serve the Lord no matter what. I'm going to refuse the king's meat. I'm going to refuse the king's drink. I'm going to serve my God. And in the process of that, he was able to interpret the king's dream. And as a result of that, the king, who was a very ungodly man, honored and glorified Yahweh, the one true God. And he was able to work his way up through service. But he uniquely understood the difference between the power in man and the power of God, especially when he was, he was basically told, you must stop praying to God. It was the law, you must yeah. stop praying to God. And he said, I will obey God rather than man. And he was thrown into the pit, and God saved him from that. And I just love what is in this verse in Daniel. Even before he went through all that, he was identifying just how much control God has over the affairs of man. He was saying that God is almighty, and he is powerful. He has the heart of the king in his hands. He raises up kings, and he puts down kings. And as a result of his testimony and magnifying the name of God and saying that you were in control and you have the majesty and authority, and in my position in government, I will honor you, the Lord was magnified and glorified through that. That's our goal every single day, and the world may come after us. We don't care. We're going to stand strong for it. We're going to stand strong for our creator, no matter what man may say. We genuinely are afraid of the Christian church influencing the culture because it, it does. It threatens everything that they're for, whether it's the money, like you're talking about with the medical industrial complex, or it's the government powerful control. You know, when you were talking backstage about all of the people that are being fed at your church, that is a threat to the government control through the welfare system. You're literally replacing government, and the church is becoming, once again, the epicenter of the community as it should, and pushing government back into the places that it should be. It does have certain things it should do, but they're very limited. And so if, if people have, quote, unquote, Christian nationalism, what, they, what those people that use that term mean and what they're afraid of is that means that Christian principles are, once again, going to permeate the culture. Now, that should mean that means people are going to treat their neighbor the way they want to be treated. That's a pretty good Christian principle that produces a great society. What they're afraid afraid of and what you hit on with the transgender issue is they're afraid that if Christianity influences the culture, we're actually going to stand for something. And we're going to say that there are some things that are flat out wrong. And yes, we will outlaw them. You may not carve up 12 year olds in our communities. We're not going to allow it. You may not groom our children at our local public schools. So that's at the heart of all of this. That's what they're afraid of. That's why they're attacking you guys, because you represent that most important part of the community that will say no. That doesn't mean that only Christians will say no. 
What they, the mistake that they've made at this point is now they've got the mama bears, whether they're a Christian or some other religion, yeah. that are saying, no, you will not do the, this yeah, to our children. On. Men are beginning to stand up and say, even though they don't have the Christian foundation that what they have, remember that God's revealed that in their hearts as well, right? So we have the law of nature, and nature's God. God's put that on our heart. So now they've crossed the Rubicon. They, like, they've gone so far now, it's not just Christians that are standing up. But when we stand, we're the biggest threat, not only because of the numbers, but when we stand up, others will rally with us. If we don't stand up, there's just no center. There's nothing like the Christian church to stand up in, the, in this country and, and, and rally people. And plus, we have the history on our side. We can actually point back to our founding fathers and to our founding documents and the influence of Christianity in those areas. So the whole reason they're after us, we are a threat to their French Revolution, Roman insanity of everything, do whatever feels good. There is no man or woman. Everybody have sex with whoever and whatever you want, we're, they see us as a threat to that. We're actually willing to say no right. to certain things. We shouldn't be afraid of that. We should be proud of that. And it's time for us to stand up and say, there is a line and we're not going to let you cross it in our neighborhoods. And just to add, Go ahead. This is a multi-billion, billion with a B, billion dollar industry. So when you start tracing back the money trail, it's going to tell you everything that you need to know. Do they care about your children? Absolutely not. They just created a customer for life. Because you have sure. hormone problems, you have physical problems, you have mental problems. This is all covered by the state. This is all covered by federal funding. So you have to follow the money trail, just like with abortion. Abortion, do they care about women's rights? No. It's a multi-billion, billion with a B dollar industry. So when you start doing the incredible opportunity as a citizen and start looking into the research of, hey, where's this money coming from? And actually you're held accountable to this. So we're going to hold you accountable to this. It starts speaking pretty loud for itself. Amen. All right. So in these last few minutes, here's what we're going to do. Uh, you've heard from, uh, would you give them a hand if you enjoyed that tonight? Yeah. Good word. Thank you. Thank you. And listen, we're just getting started on so much that's happening here. And I know that you're, you're going to be back tomorrow. So we're going to start to wrap things up. However, there's some business we need to take care of. And I'm going to ask Pastor Hank to help me to start off with it is many of us have in this room, have family members that have been affected by this whole trans movement. Many of you have family members who are the homosexual movement uh, and, and what's going on and the, and the lies that they've been told. Many of you have kids that have walked away from church and quite frankly, I understand why. So it's time for us. Now out there, you should have received in your envelope when you came in tonight, a, a magnet. It's a big refrigerator magnet if you still have a metal magnetic refrigerator. <laughs> Uh, and in there is the watchman decree. So Reed, can you find me one? I want to read that tonight. If you got one, we're going to, we're going to stand up. Now, if you don't want to do this decree, that's fine. We did this in Atlanta and I, we, that was Newsweek and Rolling Stone. I don't care. I don't, I don't care. So it, those of you guys, uh, that, L love us so much. I'm going to give you some more material. So we're going, if you, if you agree with this, we're going to, we're going to read this decree together. This is a shorter version. Thank you, Reed. So if you found it, go ahead and t stand to your feet. So Pastor Hank, I want you to come up forward here and we're going to pray over our families. And after you do that, then I'm going to read this decree. Amen. So especially those, and we're going to spend more time tomorrow on prodigals. Uh, but tonight I want to, I really want to talk about those that are affected by this movement that are, they've bought the lie. They've, they've bought the lie of what they're dealing with. And, and, and I know that there's parents here and grandparents that are going, I don't know how to deal with this. I don't know. I don't know what to do, please. All right. I think we should all go to the Lord, and I do feel this before I, we go to the Lord, that I want to pray something also on you, and that is that the Spirit of God Himself will come. You know, they pray, grant us more boldness, and God answered, and, and He granted them more boldness. 
I believe boldness is something that God is looking for in this time. Heavenly Father, we come to you. It's our honor to be seated with you in heavenly places in Christ. And so we speak and we pray from that place of authority that you have given to us. And you even said that when we come, we can receive. We don't even have to ask. We would receive your grace. We would receive your mercy. We would receive your help in every time of our needs. And so as we come before your throne, you look and you see our family members. You look and you see our loved ones. And we declare that the grace of God touches their life. The unmerited favor causes any blinders to come over their eyes. That the Spirit of God himself who stands as the greatest entity in the earth touches them with the Spirit of truth and causes them to be quickened by the same Spirit that quickened the mortal body of Yeshua. Quicken them to the truth. Open their eyes that they will know and they will understand who Yeshua is and what the truth is at this time. We are asking you to extend mercy. Protect their life. Bring a preservation so that they can have laborers come to present the word of God, the gospel in love and in power and demonstration. We're asking you, God, for your help, that you would extend your hand, that you would begin to touch the hearts, even the media God of our country, even those, Lord, who are bent to report things that grieve your heart, but they know are not true, or they twist the words with subtlety, and it has caused some and many in this country to believe false narratives and lies that have caused them to go down very, very wrong and dangerous paths. We do not bring judgment to these, but instead we cry out for your mercy. We expect your your love to show them the better way. We expect your hand to guide them and lead them not only into truth that lifts the veil off of them, that a great awakening shall come unto the people, unto our loved ones, even unto those who persecute us. And we stand before you and we remind you of a verse that declared even about the Messiah, Luke 1, 71, that God in this time in America where there's been such confusion, we've seen people go a wrong way. Way, uh, ways that are contrary to truth, contrary to the gospel, and are very dangerous because the way of a transgressor you said is hard. We pray, Luke 1 71, deliver us from those who hate us, yes. deliver us from our enemies, and may you caught our eyes. And may your enemies be scattered, but let our enemies have a visitation that comes not of our might, not of our power, but by your spirit. Lastly, I pray an anointing of boldness would rest upon the people, that they will stand and they will know the truth, and that truth will set them free, and they will speak and they will walk in a greater boldness in this time, in Yeshua's name.